Hi, my name is Greg Niemeyer, and I'm your instructor for American Cybercultures. We are going to start our experience looking at what does it take to be an internet citizen by asking the question of identity. How do we perform identity? How is identity constructed? And how um, has the notion of identity changed over time? Where does it come from and um, what makes it so important for new media. So the first thing you do when you get onto a computer typically is to log in. And when you log in, you perform your identity. You might have different identities for different reasons. You might have a bunch of emails. You might have a bunch of accounts here and there. You even have to log in to take this very course. So uh, the computer wants to know if you are a human. And the computer also wants to know uh, which particular human you are and um, so the question of human or not really is at the core of identity what kind of thing are you or what kind of creature are you are you a human are you an animal are you a, a plant tree these are by no means trivial questions because historically we have drifted in and out of being humans depending on who we asked and who we were so human or not names as a medium for humanity is the lecture title for today I want to show you some slides here. Uh, the first one is called the capture slide. Well, the capture slide is interesting. It shows us how Gmail, Yahoo, and Hotmail have different ways of uh, giving you blurred words to read and to type in again uh, in an effort to find out if you are truly a human being or not. And uh, capture is an acronym. It stands for a completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart. So right there off the bat, the simple login with a CAPTCHA is a test to see if you're human or not. Now, typically the, the debate is where is the boundary between humans and animals? But here the boundary is, where is or the debate is, where is the boundary between computers and humans? And why has that shifted? Well, be, perhaps because we now live in a context and a culture where to distinguish us from our technologies is much more important than to distinguish us from animals. Uh, of course, there's a precedent here. Uh, this is not the first time that we wonder who is a human, who is not a human, and uh, it's a very different case of a, of a slave bill from 1807 that uh, documents that one uh, slave, uh, Jacob, one Negro boy, Jacob, is being sold from one uh, slave uh, owner to another. And uh, this uh, document has three names on it. Uh, the name of the boy Jacob, the name of uh, Robert Hall, one owner, and uh, the buyer, uh, a certain Mr. Stewart. It's a little hard to make out the letters. But uh, this uh, document, which is historically rich, but also tragic, uh, illustrates how indeed uh, some of us were considered uh, human or not human, depending on where we were and what we looked like. There's a long history of slavery that goes back to, to Greece and uh, the early Greek democracies and probably before that. And uh, in each turn uh, of slavery, uh, one group of people were considered uh, to be non-human, more like animals, and uh, others were to be considered human uh, with certain civic rights. So the question of whether your identity is established as a human identity is at the core of what does it mean to be a citizen. And uh, uh, some people use this uh, Latin phrase, nomen is numen, the name is your fate, the name is your spirit, uh, to illustrate how powerful uh, names are. And um, uh, there is a, there's a discipline in anthropology that talks about names called onomastics, the, the, the study of uh, names and uh, uh, there's a few fundamental aspects to naming that uh, I want to cover quickly here. One is the uh, the fact that mostly uh, we are given names by our parents and uh, we don't give our own names to ourselves and sometimes even our parents don't have the names from themselves, they got them from their parents too. So names go way back and establish a lineage um, and establish a justification of just what kind of human you might be and what kind of genetic uh, heritage you represent. And of course, the name doesn't reveal the full genetic code, but it reveals one line, one line of uh, inheritance.
Um, so uh, there's a way out there. You, we all have chances to give each other or ourselves nicknames. And if we give ourselves nicknames, we start to uh, take back the power of the name giving. And uh, we say um, that we are not happy with the name that we were given by somebody else, but rather we were going to establish a new name for ourselves. Uh, it's very important in, in some music contexts and uh, some performance contexts. Um, but uh, many of us have nicknames simply because uh, we have email handles that are different from our uh, real names. And that's the first time we get to name ourselves when we say, oh, what's your email address? I'm going to make up a new email address for myself. The name, of course, uh, represents another kind of power, which is that it ties your physical body to your citizenship in a state uh, by means of the birth certificate and the passport and the social security number. All these devices are inscriptions of your physical personhood into the system of the state. In other words, your body enters a bureaucracy. We'll come back to that topic later. Uh, now, names can imply a lot of things. They can imply race, gender, class, status, rank. Names are knowledge, and knowledge, of course, is control. That's another element that lives in the, in the phrase nomen is numen. Um, uh, the, no, the, the name implies a certain level of control. Um, in military, of course, the name is very important. The name goes with the rank, and uh, the rank and the name tells somebody exactly where in the military you might stand in terms of the authoritarian hierarchical structure. In an, aristoc in a, in an aristoc aristocracy, it's uh, the name that indicates your provenance, your, um, your, uh, the place you come from, the place that you own, the place that um, makes you an aristocrat, the, place, the land that uh, you're in charge of. Um, uh, so if somebody's called von Holstein, that means that they're originally from the land of Holstein and uh, probably in a capacity of owning that land. Uh, so uh, that uh, aristocracy uh, is, a, is a thing of the past for the most part, uh, a birthright. Uh, the, I was born into one family, therefore I now own the land that that family always owned. <laughs> or I wasn't born into that family and therefore I don't own any land and I have to work on it, um, and work on it for the rest of my life and I'll never own it. So that's a very static, binary situation. Either you own the land or the landowner owns you. Um, so. Uh, Names also indicate education. Uh, for example, we all acquire different titles in our in our educational courses. Some of us are doctors, some of us are uh, masters of certain things, and other um, some of us are professors, and uh, some of us uh, um, have um, are a craft that we that we uh, have developed, and uh, that becomes our name eventually. For example, uh, the 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 raisin grower. Ravensburg um, happens to have the name a mountain full of vines uh, and so so that matches his profession and maybe there was an ancestor who did that already and so they've been doing it for a long time so their their profession and their family name eventually became together uh, came together uh, there the, another attribute of names that's very interesting is that names must be exclusive you want to have your own very particular name that ties only you uh, to your to your only your name to your specific body and that one-to-one -one relationship between name and body is actually difficult to establish because uh, every now and then somebody has the same name as you and um, mostly we find out a way to if, say we're in a, in a class or in a, in a group of people and we have the same name as somebody else we will um, specify ourselves uh, uh, we will pronounce our name differently we'll uh, use our middle name or something to make sure that there is no confusion. And um, the confusion is tragic because it challenges individuality. It challenges uh, the kind of important notion we have that we are existing onto ourselves and that we're not somehow sp spread across two or three bodies, but that our body is our own and, and our name reflects that, that sense of uh, agency of ownership over our body. Um, there's some uh, interesting examples. Uh, sometimes you find somebody who looks exactly like you and uh, you you uh, got to figure out if that is a, a, a situation you can live with or, or not. And uh, in, in fiction sometimes uh, this leads to great tragedy. The double Dostoevsky wrote a book uh, 
Fyodor Dostoevsky, Russian author, wrote a book called The Double, in which one man finds himself haunted by his double, who looks the same and has the same name and lives in the same apartment. And of course, uh, looking at it from a reader's perspective, we quickly find out that um, the man is delusional and so um, imagines that there's two of him, but really there's only one, and uh, a mind in that one that is not quite typical. So uh, another uh, uh, aspect of this of this exclusivity is that the state always needs to understand the name um, in a in a very precise way. So uh, in 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 China, there was an article recently in the New York Times describing how uh, there has been a subset of Chinese characters that can be turned into names because there were too many different ways of spelling or, or two different associations between sounds and characters. And so, so now there's actually a state approved list of names that you can name yourself or name your children. Uh, and uh, if, you're not on, if your name is not on that list, well, uh, you, you have to change your name. Um, that is for more transparency in, uh, in the state. Uh, a similar system occurs in Catholic uh, uh, in, in communities that are organized according to the Catholic faith, in which um, you're supposed to take on the name of a saint. Uh, for example, my name is Greg. It comes from Saint Gregory, Saint uh, Saint Gregor. Uh, he would, I don't even know if, what kind of a saint he was. I didn't follow up on that, so I'm not very close to that tradition. But um, there are times where people wanted to be called something like. Uh, Soya or Sir Zoroya or I don't know and they just made up that name and they liked it and uh, so So they went to the to the naming institution and said hey I want this funny name that I just made up and the institution would say no It must be one of these 365 names that um, is on our list here. And if it's not one of those I'm sorry you don't fit into the system uh, And that shows how the name basically illustrates compliance with a larger system so even if we go log on and just say hi uh, my name is uh, Greg, and I'm logging on to my server now. We are essentially creating a connection between our body and an established system uh, of control. And uh, the key question in this situation is whether we have the power to, uh, to shape that relationship between our identity and uh, the system we're part of, or if we're not allowed to shape it. And there's several types of crises that um, uh, we have illustrated in this uh, a collection of videos here that I uh, invite you to explore. So briefly, the first one is uh, uh, showing Harrison Ford here in Blade Runner, and he is uh, interviewing a, uh, a, a humanoid creature um, uh, who uh, looks like a human but is not quite fully human in the sense that she does not have a history, and he uses a test to determine if this person he's talking to, this interlocutor, is in fact a humanoid or uh, a real human. And um, so another case we have here is the, the Ting Ting singing a song, that's not my name. You call me X, you call me Y, you call me Z, but that's not my name. And it's the, it's the voice of a woman uh, frustrated with being uh, perhaps objectified or blended into certain expectations and saying, no, I don't want to fit your expectations. Uh, I'm not going to take any name you give me or call me. I'm going to insist that I have a name and uh, you call me the wrong name, you're offending me. So how does it feel if you're called a wrong name? Um, it's offensive, it's, it's hurtful. It indicates that the other person thinks you're somebody else or doesn't think hard enough about who you are to ask, excuse me, I know we met before and I forgot your name and uh, it's my fault, I'm terribly sorry about that, but please remind me. Um, they just make an assumption and say, oh, you look like one of those Lisas, or like one of those Jennifers, or one of those She's, or one of those Darlings, and uh, that's not gonna work in most cases. So uh, in this song, the Ting Ting speak out against that. Um, in a much more historically uh, dramatic setting, uh, Malcolm X uh, has uh, uh, as a, it's giving an interview in the lower right corner right here. Um, it's giving an interview where he explains why he is taking the last name X and he has, why he has dropped the name of his parents. And he says, well, I dropped the name of my parents because um, I, I don't want to know it because it's not the name of my family. 
It is given to me by a slave owner who once owned uh, one of my forefathers, and uh, I don't want to continue that history, so therefore I erase the history and I say, my name is now X. Right here is the HeLa cell. Well, the HeLa cell is an interesting case of an identity of a single human being that has uh, become sort of immortal. And it used to grow, belong to Henrietta Lacks. And Henrietta Lacks was a cancer patient who, some 50 years ago, was diagnosed with cervical cancer, had given a sample of her tissue um, to Johns Hopkins Hospital uh, without consent. It was removed from her body while she was uh, anesthetized. And so uh, the researchers at uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital managed to replicate that cell in a petri dish. And it was the first cell that was successfully replicated. Now it was a cancerous cell, but uh, it was still very useful for research because um, researchers were interested in having a cell line that they could figure out more about cancer on. So they did a lot of experiments on this cell line. And they now this HeLa cell does carry the DNA of Henrietta Lacks, uh, plus the, the cancerous uh, uh, modifications. Um, but uh, in a sense, he, uh, Henrietta Lacks has long passed, and her DNA lives on in this, uh, in this immortal cancer cell that has been cloned millions and millions of times and um, has, has led if you added all this, all the cells up to a single body, it would add up to a, a body of multiple tons at this point. And uh, the body of Henrietta Lacks in the form of the cell has been sent into outer space. It has been sent into all parts of the world and it's uh, thriving and reproducing at the same time um, in many, many locations around the world and many research labs around the world. And uh, there's very many publications on it thousands and thousands of publications about um, uh, research on every aspect of the cell. So although um, her heritage uh, has not been acknowledged uh, until recently, um, she has um, become immortal in a scientific way. Uh, and her name lives on in the abbreviated form of HeLa, but her identity has become multiple. So in one case here, we're testing with Harrison Ford and Blade Runner if the person naming the other person is actually dealing with a human or a non-human. And if it's a non-human, um, she doesn't deserve a name. In the case of the HeLa cell, uh, we've we're looking at a, hu a human being whose body has been technologically reproduced and spread around the world and has been given a new name that somehow obliquely refers to the original person, Hila, Henrietta Lacks, but actually erases her name and uh, uh, abbreviates it and turns it into a, a medical brand, as it were, a technical brand, as it were. And then we have the case of Malcolm X, who is refusing the name of his father because he says that it was given uh, to his family in an oppressive situation where he was being named by somebody who considered him non-human and therefore he rejected uh, the name. And finally, the Ting Tings who are speaking out against being objectified and labeled and um, being reduced to a, uh, a type rather than an individual. So the Ting Tings are saying, I'm not a type, I'm not somebody who looks like somebody else, I'm not somebody who's fulfilling a particular fantasy or I'm actually a real person and I want you to call me by my real name. The name connect, creates a connection between the individual body and the system that it's living in. And uh, the more we can control that process, the more we're in control of the system and the more just our interactions with that system will become. Thank you very much. Hope to talk to you soon again.